All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so just to quickly recap, I know we've covered this before. Um, the aftermath of the war, 58,000 killed, 300,000 wounded, 300 missing in action. Uh, this is all part of that social cost, right, of the war. Uh, that resulted in protests. So maybe on your essay you could have talked about the new left or the protest movement, counterculture, whatever else. $150 billion is the economic impact in your essay. You could have wrote about how we diverted funds, we were wasting money, whatever else. Could have been a good part. Distrust of the government is a social political impact. You could have mentioned as well. Abolishment of the draft. And the 26th Amendment is a social impact as well, or political impact. Did anyone talk about the 26th Amendment in their essays? Good. If you talk about the 26th Amendment, I mean, you don't have to, but that's always a good fact to use. People sometimes forget that that's part of it. But good. If you did, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, in any case, folks, we also talked about just quick lessons uh, for future presidents. Uh, do these still apply today? Most definitely. These lessons still apply today. Um, we have to learn that these things are still important regardless. Um, and so just be aware of that. Watch our letters home. We did this. Uh, there's your essay. Okay, Nixon's Cold War foreign policy. We're going to finish Nixon today, guys, and then we're going to end next week with the rest of the Cold War presidents. We'll get to uh, modern day, and then we'll be done. And then we'll take your practice test uh, on Tuesday, and then we will take your Unit 10 test on Thursday, Friday. So, it's catching up, and we'll be done. Nixon's Cold War foreign policy. Nixon's Cold War foreign policy. And the question we always ask for our Cold War presidents is did he increase or decrease tensions? And so we will discuss this today. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you could have talked about Vietnam. What was there a section on Vietnam, though? Yeah. yeah, so if you did it in the Vietnam section, you should be fine. I'll make sure I update the grades accordingly if I took points off for that. Anywho, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Nixon's foreign policy was crafted by this man, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Very smart man. I've heard him speak a few times. Um, at UCLA and Claremont Colleges. He's brilliant. He still advises presidents today, and he really is probably one of the smartest people with regard to politics today. He just has a keen mind for understanding the world. Um, and he crafted his own political philosophy on this idea of realpolitik. And the notion of realpolitik or realpolitik was that America should focus on the nation's interests and not ideology. Let me repeat that. America should focus on the nation's interests and not on ideology. So America should focus on the nation's interests and not ideology. Let me explain what that means, folks. No offense, for example, to Cyprus. But if Cyprus, uh, a small country in the Mediterranean, falls to communism, should America, according to Henry Kissinger, get involved and prevent the spread of communism there? No. He's saying no. Because if Cyprus falls to communism, is that going to have a huge impact on America? Not really. And so what he's saying is, look, in countries where it doesn't really affect us, should we still try to prevent the spread of communism? And he's saying what? No, we shouldn't, because we should focus on our interest as a country and not this ideology of communism is bad if it spreads anywhere. So what he's saying is we should intervene where it matters. If, for example, I don't know, the Democratic Republic of the Congo falls to communism, is that going to affect America a lot? Not really. So we let communism spread there, because is it really going to affect us? No. But if West Germany starts to fall to communism. Should America get involved? Yes, because that's a major military ally of ours. Is that going to affect our national interest? So what he's saying under realpolitik is let's get involved where it matters and not care so much about ideology. Now, are you really going to fight every single fight? I mean, he says no, that's, that's not worth our time. You want to spend $50 billion fighting a war that isn't going to affect us anyway? If Antarctica falls under communism, should we care? No. Their economy doesn't affect ours. I'm sure the penguins don't make that much money anyway. 
So the reality is, again, realpolitik. Fight the fights that are worth fighting, ignore the rest. Make sense to everyone so far? So again, so are we trying to get more involved or less involved? Less involved, right? If things fall, things fall. But if it's important, we get involved. So the foreign policy that he drafted with this idea of realpolitik for Nixon was something called detente. Detente was, uh, it's French, for reducing or easing tensions. That's what detente means uh, for Nixon. It's reducing or easing tensions, detente. And in this case, reducing or easing tensions with the Soviet Union, detente. And so what this looked like is they had a lot of meetings with the Soviet Union. They began to talk a lot more. It wasn't just, you're bad and we're bad and things will always be bad. We tried to negotiate a lot more. We had a lot of summits and meetings. So detente, we're going to actively try to reduce tensions. One way we did that was through SALT-1 or the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. SALT-1 or the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. And the basic idea of SALT-1 was to do what, Ryan? What is the basic idea of SALT-1? Reduce, uh, reduce nuclear weapons, reduce nuclear arms is the basic idea. So if you look at this graph or chart here, folks, pretty simple. The agreements of SALT-1 were that we would reduce our ABM. You have to write all this down. But ABM is anti-ballistic missile. If you guys ever see that term, and ABM is anti-ballistic missile. Um, An ICBM, does anyone know what ICBM stands for? intercontinental ballistic missile. An intercontinental missile is a missile that can go where? Pretty much anywhere, right? It can go across continents. Uh, and so it was a really large warhead that can go, or a really large missile that can go across the world. Um, and so an ABM, ICBMs, warheads we were going to reduce, and then of course nuclear submarines. And so the basic idea here is that we were going to have nuclear limits for both countries, and is that going to ease or increase tensions? Eased and right, we're not gonna, we're not so worried about killing each other because we're gonna reduce those tensions. We're less likely to murder each other, and that's nice. It's nice when you have less of a capacity to kill the world over. That's good. Then Nixon in China. Another really good way to make uh, to ease tensions was that Nixon wanted to become friendlier with China. Why might we want to become friendlier with China? China was what? Communist, but they were the largest communist country in the world. I mean, Soviets may have been the most powerful, but they were the most populous. And were they the second most powerful communist country in the world? Sure. So here's the basic idea behind this. If we can become China's friend, and China is a Soviet Union's friend, then maybe what? We can be the Soviet Union's friend too. The friend of my friend is my friend, right? If, if, if we're not really close right now, but we have a really good intermediary person, like, hey, uh, also, you're really you're good friends with uh, Stephen there? That's cool. I like Stephen, too. He's, he's a funny guy. <laughs> it's funny, yeah. <laughs> we should hang out. Oh, cool. That's the basic idea, is that if we want to cool tensions with the Soviet Union, we need to be friendly with China. But the other reason why we did this was that if China becomes our friend, then they're less of a friend of who? The Soviet Union. Because really, it's us or them, right? And on a spectrum, if they're all the way towards the Soviet Union, and they slowly become our friend, does that mean they're less friendly with the Soviets? That's the idea. And so if they're friends with us, then they're less friendly with the Soviet Union. We're actually still playing this game today, guys. Even today, in, 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 this, in this world, China and Russia, no longer the Soviet Union, are still really tight and really close friends. But as America's trade policy expands with China, we're trying to push them further on our side. Because China is a very powerful country, economically, militarily, whatever. So we're still playing this game with the Soviet Union. Uh, so Russia, rather. And so when it comes to like diplomacy and politics, China and Russia seem to see eye to eye on a lot of things, like you know, getting involved in wars, supporting Iran, supporting you know Syria, whatever. But when it comes to other things, like we're having them lean more towards us. But they're actually going to probably become closer BFFs now, China and Russia, because Russia is supplying the majority of China's energy. 
And so that's going to really dictate policy in that region. Again, folks, international politics is fantastically interesting. If you guys ever go to college, which I imagine most of you will, and you study international, if you get a chance to study international politics and specifically the China Russia relationship, it's fantastic. Right? It's interesting. Anyway, ping pong diplomacy is one way we're going to go ahead and open our relationship with China called ping pong diplomacy, where we literally used ping pong to make a Chinese-American relationship better. Another way to look at Chinese-American Chinese folks, uh, another term is to use is Sino-American relationship. So if you see the term Sino-American, that just means Chinese-American relationships, okay? Sino-American relationships. And what we did to kind of ease tensions is we sent the US ping pong team over to China to play. It wasn't like, you know, hey, go be spies for us. But the US sent the US ping pong team to China to play ping pong. And this was supposed to be a cultural exchange. You know? Because if the Chinese players and the American players could get along, then maybe what? China and America could get along. If there's not very many differences between us, and our people can get along, maybe our governments could get along too. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's a cultural exchange. It's what we call soft politics, where we're not like yelling at each other, we're letting our people communicate. So that nuclear program that I work with, that's soft politics between America and Russia. We're still trying to ease tensions regarding our nuclear stockpiles, so we're using our students to discuss nuclear warheads and nuclear power to kind of ease the tensions between the two countries about nuclear weapons and nuclear power. But ping pong diplomacy, it proves pretty successful, folks, because it does open relations with China. Here's ping pong diplomacy, China and Colombia playing. Pretty cool. Uh, but the interesting impact behind this, folks, is that as we, begin, as we get friendlier with China, who do we push away? Taiwan. So as we get friendly with China, we start pushing away Taiwan. And as China becomes more friendly with America, who do they start pushing away? the Soviet Union. Oops. And so again, you see this relationship get closer, but we're pushing our friends to the sides. As we get friendly with China, America pushes Taiwan away, who was previously like the real China to us. And as we get closer to China, China pushes the Soviet Union away. Does that make sense to everyone? So you can't be friends with everyone. You gotta choose sides. And as we become BFFs, we push our friends further away. Cool. Cool. Well, actually, Nixon visits China. That's pretty awesome. And he's the first president to visit China. And is this going to make us closer to China then? Most definitely. Um, and so by visiting China, folks, um, this will just make things a lot easier between China and uh, the US. And by us becoming closer to China, is that going to make it more difficult for Russia and America to go to war? Yeah, because if we're friends with China, and China's the ally of Russia, if there's a problem between America and the Soviet Union, who's going to be able to maybe create a peace between those two countries? China is now in a position of, hey guys, calm down. No, we, 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 all, we all had drinks together. What's the problem? Why can't we all be friends? So China becomes that middleman that we can both use and say, hey, don't make China mad. And they're kind of like that balancing act now. So that's interesting. Eventually, by 1979, America recognizes China officially. So by 1979, America officially recognizes China as a country. Because before, who do we say was the real China? Taiwan. But by 1979, we're like, sorry, Taiwan. China is more important, you know, politically. And so you see what I mean by a uh, real politic? Yes, Taiwan is important, but is China more important to us now? So we're going to say, ah, you know what? It is a communist country, but we're going to recognize them as the real, ti real China now. Because realpolitik, it was better for us. Cool with everyone? Awesome. So was detente successful? Did tensions cool under Nixon? Definitely. You know, we, saw, we signed SALT-1 and we uh, made tensions easier with China. So was detente successful? Definitely. <laughs> That was quick, right? Cool. Let's talk about Nixon's domestic policies then. What did Nixon do as president? His domestic policies. 
Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, one of the major problems that Nixon is going to uh, deal with early on in his second term is the energy crisis of 1973. And it was caused by the Arab oil embargo. Pretty much the Arab countries in the Middle East that were producing oil stopped selling us oil. And they stopped selling us oil because we were supporting what Middle Eastern country that the Arabs don't like? Huh? Which country don't, like, Iran and all those other countries not like? What's that Middle Eastern country that all the Arab countries hate? Huh? What is it? Israel. So, Israel. So pretty much what's happening here, folks, is that because we supported Israel, there's a war going on, something called the Yom, Yom Kippur War. We're not going to talk about that. But there's a war going on in the Middle East between Israel and the Arab countries, and we support Israel. And so the Arab countries are pissed off at us. They're like, fine, America, you're not going to support us. You're going to support Israel. We're not going to sell you oil. Is that going to become a problem for America? America is an oil-dependent country. We need oil. And as a result, oil prices went up to an all-time high. Oil began to run out, folks. I mean, guys, look. Oil went up at that time as much as 89 cents. Now, you guys may be like, what? That's nothing compared to today. But remember, folks, inflation. If the standard wage in California was $3 back then, that's minimum wage, then three or 89 cents of $3 is a huge portion of your income. That's like 30% of what you make is gasoline. Is that a big, uh, is that a big amount? Hey guys, equivalent today, if 825 is the equivalent of minimum wage today, imagine if gasoline was like $5 or 550, okay? That's a lot. And so, I mean, gasoline today is like 425, but if gasoline became like $6, would that be a, be a problem for a lot of Americans? It would be. And so that's the issue. Gasoline went up really high. Um, in fact, uh, we began to ration gasoline because we were running out of it. Gas stations were closing. It became a problem, guys. I mean, this is a, a long line of people waiting in line for gasoline. It's not good. So you had that going on. And again, so Nixon comes with all these plans. Oh, and the uh, embargo was caused by OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Pretty much, there are only so many countries that have oil reserves. And OPEC was kind of how they put them all together. And all those countries work together to sell oil at a high price. It's like they're a what? When all these different companies come together and they increase, they're not a monopoly because it's multiple countries. Trust. It's a trust or a pool. So they're like, it's a, it's, a, it's a global pool, guys. It's a global pool. They come together and they increase prices. They do it today, OPEC. It's kind of messed up. But some of the OPEC countries are our friends, so they try to reduce prices, but the, basically they control the oil supply. And they sell it to us and they can charge pretty much whatever they want, but then we complain. In any case, OPEC. Cool? He deals with that. Then he has new federalism. New federalism becomes the name of his domestic policy. New federalism because the name becomes the name of his domestic policy, new federalism. And the basic idea behind new federalism, by the way, what is federalism? Federalism is the sharing of powers between who? It's a sharing of powers between what? State and which government though? State is a government, so state and federal, right? So federalism is a sharing of powers between state and federal. Remember that, folks, state and national government. So in new federalism, he decided he was gonna give more power back to who? the states. Under new federalism, Nixon wanted to give more power back to the states. Things like social welfare programs, minimum wage. He wanted to give more power back to the states. So social welfare programs, health care, all that stuff. That power would be given back to the states. When was a lot of that power taken from the states? Which president took a lot of that power and gave it to the federal government? Which president did that? who took all the powers from the state and made a very powerful presidency. Who was the last president that just made this supremely powerful presidency that tried to just control the US economy? For a good reason, he needed to. But which president was that? Was it like, over, like overpoweringly controlling the US economy? 
Hmm? FDR. Remember how FDR created the New Deal? He just said, the government will do this, 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 and this. You can also go back and say, like, the progressive presidents, TR, Wilson, Taft, they kind of did that too. But FDR was the first and most recent. By the way, what was FDR's domestic policy called? New Deal. What is Truman's domestic policy? So you have fair, de uh, sorry, New Deal for FDR. Truman's is fair deal. Eisenhower, as most people forget this one, he built the highway, but his was called dynamic conservatism, but it's okay if you forget that one. John Kennedy's is New Frontier, and Johnson's is Great Society, and Nixon's is New Federalism. Okay, so again, you have all these multiple types of foreign domestic policies. Don't worry, I'll give you a chart for all the presidents. Um, do you guys have to complete? But again, you guys need to be familiar with all of these domestic policies. So new federalism, again, was going to give more power to the uh, states. In addition, he also dealt with civil rights. He had a mixed uh, record with regard to civil rights. Um, with regard to desegregation, folks, he opposed integration, or he opposed desegregation. He opposed desegregation. He felt that blacks and whites should still be segregated, so he opposed desegregation. And in fact, he passed an anti-busing law. He tried to pass, rather, an anti-busing law. that would prevent black kids from going to white schools. So he tried to pass an, an anti-busing law that would prevent black kids from going to white schools. Because where were most of the good schools at the time? In black neighborhoods or white neighborhoods? White neighborhoods. So the idea was, if you're supposed to be integrated, are the white kids gonna wanna come to the black schools? No. And so to make it fair, the black kids should be bused into the white schools. But Nixon said, no, we shouldn't bus black kids to white schools. <coughs> that law was overridden uh, by uh, Congress. They tried to kill that bill. And so it didn't happen. But again, he opposed desegregation. On the opposite side, though, he supported affirmative action. He supported affirmative action. And who could remind me what affirmative action is? It's when you give special preference to who? minorities and women with regard to you know, education, hiring practices. He supported uh, affirmative action with regard to you know, hiring practices and college admission of women and minorities, which is weird because that's kind of the opposite of desegregation. In many case, he has a mixed record there. Questions about that? No? Cool. Then he appoints Warren Berger to be the uh, next Supreme Court Chief Justice. I should put Chief Justice here. Who becomes the 15th Supreme Court Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So another term for him is that he's the Chief Justice of the SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States. So we have POTUS for the President. Supreme Court is SCOTUS, S-C-O-T-U-S, Supreme Court of the United States. Warren Burger will replace Earl Warren. So if you can remember them, Earl Warren, Warren Burger. Um, and Warren Burger becomes the next Supreme Court Chief Justice. There's really only four chief justices you guys have to know. Marshall, you remember Marshall way back when? He made the federal government very powerful. Taney made the states very powerful. Uh, then you have uh, Earl Warren, who did uh, Brown v. Board and Civil Rights, Kitty v. Wayne, Miranda v. Arizona. And then here's Warren Burger. The two most important cases that Warren Burger passed, are you guys ready? Are Roe v. Wade is the first. In the Supreme Court of Roe v. Wade, it gave women the right to choose, is one way to put that. So it gave women the right to choose. Another way to phrase that, it legalized abortions. And it gave women the right to choose, or it legalized abortions. 1973 Roe v. Wade. Questions there. Hmm? Hmm? Okay. Another important Supreme Court case is the UC Board of Regents versus Bakke. Now, this is the UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC Davis Board of Regents. So it's the 
state body for the UC system, and the UC Board of Regents v. Baki, or also known as the Baki case. So you can just know as the Baki case as well. It comes up that way from time to time. Well, the two things that this stated was that affirmative action was legal. So it's okay to give preference to minorities. But what is not okay? Racial quotas. It ruled that racial quotas were illegal. Let me explain what this means. If you have applicants that are applying to your school, they're saying that race can be one factor, but it cannot be the factor. So race can be one factor, but it may not be the factor for admission. So if you're looking at two applicants, white applicant and black applicant, you can say, well, the white applicant has slightly better scores, but I feel like this black applicant will provide a different perspective to the school, and I think their grades are still good, but they'll have something more to add to the community at large. Or if they're equal, and all things equal, you say, well, we should take the black applicant because they'll add more diversity, they'll add more of a perspective to the school. But what you can't do is say, we need 100 black applicants, 100 white applicants, 100 Latino applicants, and you just pick the first 100, and you say, sorry, whites, we're not even gonna consider you anymore because we met our white quota. Does that make sense to everyone? So it can't be a specific number, it's just something you're allowed to consider. So you can consider race, but you may not admit based on race. Does that make sense? That's the basic idea of the Baki case. Affirmative action is cool, but it can, race cannot be the only reason you're admitting people to college. Then Nixon dealt with the environment. Environment. Two things that he did. He created the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA that exists today. It regulates our environment, make sure that we're not spilling sewage in our lakes and rivers, cleaning our air. I mean, we, some people do do that. They spill sewage in our lakes and streams and rivers. But the EPA is responsible for you know, overseeing that. He also passed the Endangered Species Act. So like, you don't really think of Nixon as like the environmental president, but a lot of things passed during his administration that were pro-environment which is crazy, because he's a Republican. You don't really imagine Republicans being pro-environment. Um, and so you have EPA, Endangered Species Act. In fact, he was the president that uh, signed Earth Day into legislation. So you have Earth Day, April 22nd, the day we celebrate the Earth. That was Nixon who did that, so, you know, cool stuff. Uh, but a lot of this was promoted uh, by a book uh, by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring. It's a pretty important book, you guys should know. And what Silent Spring said was that the use of pesticides was harmful to the environment. The use of pesticides was harmful to the environment. You guys know what pesticides are? They're chemicals you spray on crops to prevent them from being eaten by what? Bugs, right? So you use pesticides. So the problem that uh, Rachel Carson had was that these bugs that were being sprayed by with pesticides were still being eaten by birds. And when they ingested chemicals like DDT, that's just one example of the chemicals used, DDT. Um, when the birds ingested this DDT because they were eating the bugs that were sprayed with this chemical, uh, it would get into their systems and when they would lay eggs, the eggshells were so brittle that when they would lay on them to uh, warm them up, the eggs would just crack. It couldn't sustain the weight of the mothers. And so a lot of those chicks were dying. And so the book is called Silent Spring. Why? Because there's no birds chirping. It's a pretty clever name. But does that make sense though? Is that because all these birds were dying, by the time springtime came around, you barely heard a bird chirping in, in the distance. And so you have uh, this notion that maybe we should fix the environment, not use as many pesticides, it's bad for us. Questions there? Okay. Then there's a 90 day price freeze, folks. Um, in 1970, what year is this? 
1971, inflation was increasing pretty rapidly. And so the 90-day price freeze uh, was to fight rapid inflation. It was designed to fight rapid inflation. And the reason why this was so important was also to create uh, or to, to calm consumer fears. It was also designed to calm consumer fears. Because here's what was happening, folks. Prices were jumping really quickly. And so in order to fight uh, rapid inflation to calm consumer fears, uh, he set a 90-day price freeze all across the country. Because what was happening was that milk was like, let's say, a dollar today, and then three days later, milk was $3. And so if you knew that prices were going up and up and up, what were you going to do today? You're going to stock up and buy as much as you can. And so people were stocking up, people were running out of supplies, and as, as stuff starts running out, what's going to happen to prices? It's going to go even further up. So Nixon wanted to calm the country, saying, you guys got to knock it off, calm down. So he set a 90-day price freeze, and for, 30, uh, for three months, prices stayed exactly the same across the country so that they could stabilize. And once we restocked the shelves and we found out where inflation was going, um, things got a little bit easier again. But again, the 90-day price freeze was just to curb inflation and to create, uh, to calm consumer fears at the time. And then look at the Arab oil embargo. We have an inflation. It went straight up because prices of gas were so high. Eventually, Nixon wins the election in 1972. Yeah. The only state that he lost, folks, was Massachusetts. And that's only because George McGovern was from Massachusetts. The guy he was running against was from Massachusetts. But he won every single other state. Yeah, he carried every single one. <laughs> Crazy, right? He won a lot. Um, yeah, and he won, uh, what is it? He won, oh, what's the number there? 16 million more votes. That's a huge win. 16 million more votes. Let's talk about the downfall of Nixon then. So he's doing well. And he wins the election, but then things are uncovered that are not so bueno for Nixon here. Sounds like birds chirping when I drink my, uh, my shake here. Here, listen. The Watergate scandal. Here's the background. When Nixon was running for re-election, he created a committee called the Committee to Re-Elect the President, which was abbreviated as CREEP. <laughs> so perhaps that was a poor choice of naming. Which is, you said they came with the yeah, but they came with the acronym first. So I mean, that's what they chose that. So CREEP became the re-election re committee for President Nixon. In the 1972 election, he created an organization called CREEP to help him re-win the election. Good so far. Now, many of the candidates, or, or rather Nixon and the Republicans, were nervous that the Democrats might win the election, which clearly they didn't, right? I mean, Nick McGovern only won one state. But they were nervous about what was happening. So what happened was that CREEP under uh, the charge of Nixon, had people break into the Watergate Hotel. So Nixon had some creep burglars, creep thieves, break into the Watergate Hotel. And specifically, they were breaking into the offices of the Democratic National Committee, or the DNC. So these creep officials were breaking into the Watergate Hotel, which housed the offices of the Democratic National Committee. The reason why they broke into the DNC, or the Democratic National Committee, is they wanted to steal their campaign strategy. They wanted to steal the campaign strategies. So again, they broke into the DNC, or the Democratic National Committee. And the goal was to steal their campaign strategy. The reason why they wanted to do this was this. If I'm running against President Obama in the next election, let's say, and if I, if I steal his plans and I know that Obama's going to spend $8 billion in California, should I even bother spending $4 billion in that state? No, he's going to outspend me no matter what. But if I know that he's only going to spend, let's say, 
a hundred million in Texas, then guess what? I'm gonna spend a billion there. And if I know he's gonna spend only you know ten million in Florida, I'm gonna spend fifty million. Does that make sense to everyone? So you know how to spend your money. And that's what they wanted to steal. They said, we want to know how are they going to campaign against us? Because if you know ahead of time, can you plan for that? That was the idea. They wanted to strategize by stealing the plans. They were caught. <laughs> so the people that were breaking in were arrested. Okay, so the burglars were arrested. And Nixon paid them to keep quiet. He paid them hush money, is what we call it. But Nixon and Creep paid them to keep quiet. Because did Creep and Nixon send them there in the first place? Yeah, so they paid them to say, hey, don't, you were not you know, involved with us at all. So they asked him, why'd you break in? Oh, you know, we were just curious about you know democratic stuff. Who sent you? Uh, it was just us. Just breaking in. But again, Nixon tried to uh, hide. He, Nixon tried to conceal evidence. Nixon tried to obstruct justice. He did a lot of illegal things to make sure that it wasn't tied back to the White House. But two men, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, they worked for the Washington Post. They were informed that Nixon was involved in the Watergate break-in. A secret informant told them, by the way, Nixon was involved. And he gave them all this information to, again, inform them that Nixon was involved in the Watergate break-in. They're like, oh, really? Well, that doesn't sound very good. So they informed them that Nixon was involved in the Watergate break-in. So... They uncover it, and all of a sudden, the Watergate breaks wide open. They're like, Nixon, did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? He's like, no, no, it wasn't me. And you can see here in this picture, all these people are pointing fingers at you. Like, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. But it was Nixon in the center the whole time. But now, there's like, Nixon was involved. Nixon's like, no, I didn't do anything. But the interesting thing was that even though people all said that Nixon was involved with all of this, he kept on denying it. So we needed evidence. So the evidence we suspected would come from what becomes known as the Watergate tapes. Here's the thing, folks. Nixon recorded all of his conversations on the phone and in person. He had a secret recorder in his desk, and he would record all of his conversations. And we suspect that the reason why he did that was he wanted to have blackmail on anyone in case they tried to screw him over. He would have a recording of every single conversation. Like, hey, if you mess with me, remember, I have it on tape that you said that thing that one time. So he had blackmail on everyone just in case because he was a pretty paranoid guy. And so if he recorded every conversation, what did he also probably record? He had discussions over what? Watergate, Watergate break-in. They're like, aha, Nixon, if you recorded every conversation, you probably recorded talking to the burglars. We want those tapes. Nixon said what? No, I'm not going to give them to you. And Nixon said he did not have to give up the tapes because of something called executive privilege that he just made up. He made up something called executive privilege. And I don't remember if I'm spelling that right or not. Privilege, two eyes or two eyes, right? I think it's two eyes. Yeah, two eyes. Privilege, executive privilege. And so what that meant was, because I'm president, there are certain things I get to keep secret because I'm president. And they're like, that power didn't exist before. He's like, oh, no, it always did. It was implied that because I'm president, I get to have certain privileges as president. Did Congress agree with that? Like, no way, man. No, you don't get to have that. So they sued and went to the Supreme Court. So in the Supreme Court case, where the government sued Nixon, while he's president, Congress sues Nixon in the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Nixon, the Supreme Court rules that what does Nixon have to do? The U.S. v. Nixon Supreme Court rules that Nixon must give up the tapes. He has to. They're like, ah, okay, fine. I'm not going to defy the Supreme Court. 
So he decides, and again, remember, Earl Warren is a chief justice. I mean, Berger, Warren Burger is a chief justice. He assumes that he'll be okay, but Warren Burger's like, no, I'm sorry, Nixon, you got to give up those tapes. So uh, he says, I'll give it to you guys in like three days. Let me go find them first. So he gives them the tapes after three days. I'm just assuming three days, whatever the exact date is. But something like three days. He gives them the tapes. He's like, all right. So Congress is like, oh, my God, we got the tapes. They put on their headphones. And he's like, right, I think it was in the day. He talks to Watergate. Oh, so remember us, Steve, regarding the... And they're listening on the headphones. It's completely silent. So we'll call you back on Friday. Uh, thanks, Steve. We'll see you later. Bye. Like, what? Nixon had deleted the tapes. They asked for the tapes. They never said to have the recordings on the tapes. So the tapes were deleted, and they're like, Nixon, what happened? Like, oh, are they deleted? Oh my gosh. You know what I think happened is the cleaning lady accidentally pushed the record button and record over the tapes. Ah, sorry. You recorded over the tapes. Congress was pretty pissed. But nonetheless, they know what, Nixon, we have enough on you without the tapes. And to be fair, he didn't record over all the tapes. So he got to some, but not all, because he had to turn those tapes in anyway. And so Congress begins impeachment proceedings, because did Nixon break the law? Yeah. The thing, uh, and so they begin impeachment proceedings, and they begin the process of a trial. They begin the process for a trial. Okay? Because if he's impeached, does that mean he gets removed from office? No. If he's impeached, that means he what? Goes to trial. So, remember that, folks. So they begin the process of impeachment, which means he's about to go to trial. Is he going to get impeached, guys? I mean, like, if they go through it, will he get impeached? Yeah, there's enough evidence that he clearly was involved. So knowing that he's going to go to trial, he says what? You know what? Screw it. And Nixon resigns. So Nixon resigns in 1974. Here he is resigning, saying, nope, no, no, I'm done. Again, here's his letter. I hereby resign the office of the President of the United States in 1974. And as a result, Gerald Ford will become the next President of the United States, his Vice President. Fun fact, Gerald Ford is the only President never to be elected to office because he was never elected vice president. Spiro Agnew was the vice president elected with Nixon in 72, but Spiro Agnew had to resign because of the Watergate scandal and because of tax evasion. So we appointed Gerald Ford to be the next vice president. And then Nixon resigned, so Gerald Ford became president, and he was never elected. So Gerald Ford is the only president never to be elected and serve as president of the United States, because he was an appointment. He was never elected. So he's the only unelected president of the United States. Yay! That's it, folks. <laughs>